I want to keep on moving and get to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Kyle Knipper. He is a research scientist at the USDA ARS Sustainable Agricultural Water Systems Unit in Davis, California. His work focuses on the evaluation and refinement of remote sensing based models to provide spatially representative measures of crop water use and stress for operational applications in irrigation and field management. Kyle is working closely with vineyard, almond, and olive growers in the state of California to incorporate these satellite-derived parameterization into their water management strategies. So, thank you, Kyle. Perfect. Thanks, Mac. Uh, Hi everyone, as Max said, my name is Kyle Knipper. I'm a research scientist in Davis, California for the ARS. And today I'm gonna to be talking about a comparative analysis of OpenET for evaluating ET, <laughs> OpenET for evaluating evapotranspiration in California for irrigation management. A lot of what I'm gonna be talking about and the sites that I'm gonna be talking about are part of a larger group effort um, to study a lot more than just um, satellite-based uh, validation, including uh, tree level research, um, field level research, including UAV and drones, as well as the satellite portion. But again, today I'm gonna to be focusing on, on the satellite portion. So, there we go. So uh, for context, um, this all started with the project uh, GrapeX back in 2013, um, which ultimately led to the project called T-Rex. Yes, we love our acronyms um, within the ARS, uh, which, which started because we, we wanted to better model uh, satellite-based ET over these very unique canopy structures, specifically wine grape vineyards and grape ex, and tree perennial crops, uh, most notably almond orchards in T-Rex. And we initially started doing this using the Lexi Dyslexi ET model. And the reasoning behind that is because it's based on the two source energy balance model. So what it's actually capable of doing is taking a thermal signal and partitioning it into uh, soil and canopy portions. And then we're able to uh, simultaneously solve the energy balance equation, um, both for E and T, and sum them up in the end. Again, important um, from a standpoint of almond orchards and wine grape vineyards, because you can see um, with the pictures there, there's very clearly uh, tree rows and inter rows. So important to quantify both those aspects. Um, I'm not, it's not going forward, Matt. It wasn't full screen. Go back. Try it again. There we go. There we go. Had to click over there. Oh, cool. <laughs> All right. So, uh, like I said, Grapex, um, we actually started this with a collaboration with E&J Gallo Winery, which is the world's largest family-owned winery. Uh, we had vineyards located up in Sonoma County, uh, down through the Central Valley um, at our site in Sierra Loma, which is just south of Sacramento, and then all the way down towards our Ripper Dan site in Fresno, California. Uh, we've actually recently expanded uh, the Grapex network to include regenerative uh, vineyards located near Santa Rosa in Northern California. And this was a partnership with Jackson Family Wines. They have an initiative to transition all of their vineyards, which is about 30,000 acres, to regenerative uh, by the year 2030. Um, if we focus on T-Rex, um, we have our sites here in collaboration with uh, all, uh, the Almond Board of California, as well as OFI. Again, trying to span the entire um, Central Valley of California. We have two sites. Uh, located up near Davis, California, and another also near Fresno, California. And we have also recently expanded uh, the T-Rex umbrella to also include olive ranches. So we've partnered with California Olive Ranch. We now have four flex towers uh, within those olive orchards in Northern California, two of which um, on the right there in our Oroville site are located within uh, regenerative olive orchards. So if we focus on GrapeX, again, it was the original um, project looking to evaluate satellite-based ET in, the, in these types of agricultural systems. What's unique about GrapeX and the sites is that we can go back uh, quite a few years. This is looking at six years of data. Um, for Sierra Loma in the middle, we can actually go further back 
Um, but just for clarity here, I have the, the same years. And what we find is really good correlations between OpenET Ensemble, which is the red line there, and observations uh, in blue. And a point of note, which is interesting, in 20, after the 2019 season for Sierra Loma there, they actually regrafted their vines um, to a new varietal, and you can see that, that pulse in ET, but within a year um, back up to normal measurements. Um, from a comparison standpoint, uh, strong correlations, low errors um, within all three of these sites. You can see ET estimates increasing um, from the north on top uh, to the south within the Central Valley on the bottom. And ultimately, overall at all sites, again, strong correlations and low mean absolute errors hovering around that one millimeter per day mark. Um, if we focus back in on T-Rex, we actually just submitted a paper to Ag and Forest Met looking at a comparison of open ET to almond orchards uh, within the Central Valley of California. So we have our three T-Rex sites, which are on the left, and we also included three additional almond orchards, which are part of the Ameriflex network, and were also included in John Volk's recent paper. Um, and in doing such a comparison, we find... Um, you know, good relations between observ observed ET and modeled ET. So um, the observed ET is on the x-axis, modeled is on the y. For all models included in the open ET framework, uh, the ensemble is on the top in black, and then combined almond orchards is on uh, the right axis there. And what, we're, what we really find is there's not a huge difference between the models in open ET but rather between the almond orchards that are studied. So if we just focus in on the ensemble, again, what you find time and time again is when you go from the northern half of the Central Valley to the southern half of the valley, um, which would be going left to right here, you see those increases in ET rates, again, to be expected. Um, and we also find some interesting patterns. One of them um, is that Vacaville site, the second from the left, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, <clears throat> but overall, Strong correlations, there is a bit of a tail um, at, at high ET rates. Um, but again, overall, R squared is about uh, 0.81, and that mean absolute error value sitting around one millimeter per day, which, if you will remember, aligns with what we were seeing um, in the vineyards. So that's good. Um, if we scale up from daily to weekly to monthly, weekly being a, a bit more appropriate from an irrigation management standpoint, um, statistics improving as well as monthly um, that's probably just you know time averaging um, helping out with those statistics and we can compare those again to uh, Dr. John Balk's recent paper and what we find is actually statistically um, a little worse off than those values that were reported by John um, for the orchards within his paper um, as well as all crops which inclu included both perennials and non perennials um, one of the sites that we're having, you know, a real issue with um, is this Vacaville site. So what you're seeing here is, in the red line, is the Open ET Ensemble, and blue is observations. And Vacaville is located right next to Travis Air Force Base. So it's this, like, bare, dry, and dry landscape. And we have predominant winds that come from that landscape. And what it's doing is creating this influx of energy um, over the irrigated orchard. And the orchard is well irrigated, so it's going to meet that uh, demand. So we find um, observed ET rates are really, really high um, compared to other orchards with similar you know, biomass and leaf area index um, in them. Well, we also find, you know, from a satellite perspective, you know, we're just looking straight down. It's you know, a, a 2D application. So the, the pixel in that barren landscape and the pixel in the almond orchard, it, it's not learning from you know, either or of those, of those pixels. So it, the, the satellite-based product doesn't know that this added energy is, is coming into the orchard, so values remain muted. Um, in addition to that, what we found was, uh, so in open ET, um, those ET estimates are interpolated using reference ET. Um, in California, we use the SIMIS network. And what we found was the closest SIMA station in Davis um, had vapor pressure deficit values, so a measure of advection, that were consistently lower than the vapor pressure deficit estimates that were measured at Vacaville. Um, and, in, and in that case, um, the higher uh, the VPD, the larger uh, the error. And what we found was um, when it came to like reference ET, including those vapor pressure deficit estimates, 
uh, values were uh, lower than what we would expect them to be at Davis compared to Vacaville. So all these values being used to interpolate Landsat pixels were essentially muted compared to what, um, what we were seeing on site. Um, so again, just something um, that, you know, interesting to be aware of um, when evaluating uh, these products. Something else that we saw, um, and it's, it's not as prominent in every site or every year, um, but we did notice this interesting um, comparison between OpenET and our observations um, during whole split. So this is our site OLA, OLA during, or down near Fresno, and whole split is a period um, in late July, August, September, uh, when growers pull back their irrigation quite a bit to dry out the hole of the almond, as well as dry off the, the almond floor for harvest. And what we find is our open ET values really decrease um, very quickly during this time period. The modeled values also decrease, but not really at the clip that we'd like to see. So if there is a positive bias um, between model and observed, we find that it tends to be in this late July, August, September time period that coincides again with whole split and, and harvest in almonds. Um, so I've been making a lot of comparisons uh, between modeled values and observed values or measured values, but I think it's important to take time to you know, really understand what the measurements mean and the error in the measurements. So what you see here is 2023 data for our almond orchard near Fresno, California. The yellow line is the ensemble with the spread um, around that for OpenET, and the blue is average of four different methods of estimating observed uh, or measured ET on the surface, and you can see the approaches that we took there on the left. And what we found, at least for this year, for 2023, um, for our OLA site, we find that um, measurement and model uncertainties have similar magnitudes. They're in different times of the year, but they're similar, which is really important um, when people talk about, you know, the ensemble uncertainty and, and can we trust the values. You know, what we're finding here is you also have to be able to trust um, your measurements on the ground and your observations. We also find that a lot of the biases um, between model and observations come at the tail ends. Um, we think probably cloud cover, smoke, um, other factors playing into that cover crop. But during peak irrigation times, um, when you really need um, reliable ET information, um, it's doing a very good job. Uh, in addition to doing the comparison of open ET to our eddy covariance sites, we also focused on 148 operational almond orchards um, for water year 21 and 22, and we compared to applied irrigation and precipitation. And we realize this isn't like the perfect comparison. We're not taking into account deep percolation or runoff or anything, um, but we still thought a, a, a valuable exercise. Um, so this is what you, we got. So irrigation and precipitation is on the x-axis. Ensemble ET is on the y-axis. The color bar there is plant date for the almond orchard. Um, and what we find, again, is a fairly strong correlation. I was actually a bit surprised um, at how well correlated they were and a percent difference of roughly 13%. And if we broke it down into almond age, what we found was OpenET actually underestimates irrigation precipitation by upwards of 20% in those young orchards. This is not surprising. Um, young, young, orchard are, your, young orchards are notorious for uh, over-irrigation, so they can reach production age quicker. Um, they also don't have a lot of biomass. Um, but as you can see, once the biomass increases, um, you get into those m more mature almond orchards, you know, 10 to 15, a little on 15 to 20, those are peak production years for almonds. Um, we're sitting around that, that mean percent difference error of, of 13%. Um, again, this, so I wanna refocus on Grapex just for a minute, um, specifically the two sites that we um, expanded to. Um, this data, the observed data was just processed on Friday, so we haven't had a lot of time to really dig into it. Um, but comparisons are, are really, really promising. So the black line there is the ensemble with the model um, range around it for OpenET, blue line being um, observed. So again, we haven't had a lot of time to dig into it, 
But just as an initial uh, look, this is super promising, particularly for a regenerative vineyard where there's a lot of biomass uh, in these systems, a lot of different types of biomass. It's not just the vine canopy, uh, but grasses as well. Um, again, our expansion into California Olive Ranch. So we just processed this 2023 data and the statistics aren't as great. Um, again, we need to dive into why we're seeing what we're seeing, uh, but there seems to be a lot more noise and a lot more biases when comparing uh, to the olive orchards that we have a part that we have as part of our project. Um, I do need to note that this bottom site here, we don't expect it to do very well because it's actually just a bunch of twigs um, out in the field. So what they what they do um, at California Olive Ranch is when they want to rejuvenate a site or start over, instead of replanting the entire orchard, they go around with a chainsaw and just cut it off at about three feet high. So that's what you're seeing there. But we wanted to, uh, because this is a regenerative orchard, we wanted to put an any covariance tower in here uh, because within two, three years, they're gonna be at production age. And we wanna see um, that carbon uptake, that ET, that water use um, as these trees grow out. So that um, performance down there is kind of to be expected. And one, lar or one last thing um, that we're working on, and I think this is really where rubber meets the road, particularly with OpenET, is we partnered with RTI International and, Cal and the Almond Board of California to provide an economic evaluation on the transition from business as usual, which is an ETC-based approach, crop coefficients, to something that looks more like open ET, so actual ET, and what that looks like and how much water and money growers can save um, by doing that. So we took what we knew from our T-Rex project and our grower collaborators, we talked with them, um, we worked through different scenarios, assumptions um, with everyone. You can kind of see there on the left is an adoption rate, so percentage of, of growers that are taking in this information and using it uh, throughout the years. We have different scenarios based on a wet year, a wet year or a dry year. Um, that's going to affect the cost of water. And what we found was, you know, a range between 23 and a half and 73 and a half million dollars per year that can be saved um, by farmers by transitioning from an ETC-based approach uh, to ETA or open ET. So that's all I have. Um, but I do want to note it's a very collaborative effort on the work that's um, ongoing in these projects. There's a lot of uh, brilliant people and scientists working on it. Um, so I definitely want to give them the credit where credit's due too. But thank you. Thanks a lot, Kyle. It's a very comprehensive effort and uh, one that's very well received by everyone involved. Um, yeah, uh, make sure you guys are writing down some questions and saving them for the end um, from each of these talks, for each of these speakers.